Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Senate Education. It is Thursday, March 18th, 1.34 p.m. Uh, our miscellaneous education bill, as well as school uh, discipline advisory council bill passed, uh, which is great. Uh, so if Senators Chittenden and Hooker wouldn't mind uh, just staying, uh, maybe working with Jeannie, she may be contacted or you may be contacted directly to present those bills in the House committees. Um, and if for some reason you're not comfortable doing so, uh, just give me a heads up. But the House will invite you up, I suspect, sometime next week to present those bills. Um, and if any tracking you can do as they make their way through the process um, that you're willing to do, that would be great. Since when they come back, um, We'll look to both of you to uh, lead us a little bit around the changes, um, and then you would be <clears throat> responsible for presenting any amendments uh, that we might make on the floor that the House makes. So uh, as much tracking as you can do <clears throat> is, is much appreciated. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions about that, um, please let me know. And then if we end up going to conference committees, uh, you know. Um, I don't know how Senator Lyons has made these determinations in the past, but for me, the fact that you were both uh, presented the bills uh, would automatically have you on a committee of conference. And so it would be good for you both to have um, be as fluid and as fluent uh, as you possibly can be on these issues. So thank you both for that. Uh, today, we are uh, returning to a topic that we've talked about in the past. Uh, it's our state colleges. I invited the chancellor in uh, to come in to talk to us, with us, about how things are going and to update us since uh, a vote was taken by the state board uh, with regard to next steps um, for the state colleges. And before uh, turning it over to her, I also want to mention that we will also be hearing from the Governor's Institute uh, as we are gearing up for summer programs, the Governor's Institute has played a long uh, and important role in the state as it relates to opportunities for Vermonters. They're gonna give us a little bit of an overview of where they're at, and then we'll return to H81. Uh, with that, Chancellor, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Very much appreciate it. Uh, and it looks like Ms. Lavasser as well as uh, Ms. Scott are also both with you today. So we will, so welcome back to everybody. And, and uh, Madam Chancellor, we'll let you, we'll give the floor to you and we'll let you <clears throat> navigate this with your uh, counterparts as you feel fit and um, to do. So with that, the floor is yours and uh, looking forward to the update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'm Sophie Zidatny. I'm the chancellor for the Vermont State College System. And with me today, I have Sharon Scott, who's our Chief Financial and Operating Officer, as well as Catherine Lavassa, who is our Director of External and Governmental Affairs. So thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to come back today and provide you with an update. Um, I would add that we were asked to provide some written testimony and we have submitted that. So um, just, just to, for the record to be aware that there is some written testimony out there as well in response to some questions that people had. So um, it, just a quick recap, the Vermont State College system, you know, we do change the lives of thousands of students each year by opening the door to higher paying jobs and an improved quality of life for the students, their families and their communities. Um, we're comprised of four member institutions, Castleton University, the Community College of Vermont, Northern Vermont University and Vermont Technical College. Our mission begins with For the Benefit of Vermont and the Vermont State College system is deeply rooted in the communities and regions of the state. We educate more Vermonters annually than all the other institutions of higher education in the state combined. And we employ thousands of Vermonters on our campuses and academic centers. Um, in addition, our, our uh, campuses and academic centers are also uh, centers for academic excellence, culture and community. So for over half a century, the Vermont State College system has provided access to high quality post-secondary education to students of all ages across the state. We view ourselves as the extension of the state's public pre-kindergarten through grade 12 education system, uh, and then into the post-secondary years, and we serve over 10,000 Vermonters annually. 
And as we've previously shared with you, um, the Board of Trustees has adopted four strategic priorities uh, of affordability, accessibility, quality and relevance of academic programs. And to meet its mission and these strategic priorities, the board has committed to making students our top priority, providing the support services and technologies that students need to ensure their success, uh, delivering collaborative educational programs and services that are responsive to the needs and interests of students and employers throughout the state, uh, operating as a responsive, fully integrated administrative system under strong aligned leadership that actively serves the needs of students and the people of Vermont by promoting efficiency, innovation, and collaboration. And being positioned to deliver on these outcomes on an ongoing sustainable basis in what we all recognize is to be a severely challenging demographic, economic and competitive landscape. So achieving these outcomes will require the Vermont State College system and the state um, to undertake genuinely transformative change uh, with regard to, to higher education and cultural change internally within the Vermont State College system as we become an integrated high performing organization that measures its success in terms of student and state success, coupled with a change in how the Vermont State College system is funded and held accountable to meeting those performance measures by the state. And as mentioned, we've um, going to turn to the transformation piece. Um, in considering transformation, we've been guided by the state's uh, select committee on the future of public higher education in Vermont, as well as working with the legislature, the governor and our board of trustees. Um, even before the select committee was created last summer, we had already started working on internal transformation and moving towards more unified system operations. And one of those changes was to implement a system-wide budget. Another was our work towards a common general education core across the system. As we're working to envision the Vermont State Colleges of the future, uh, we've been looking to convert uh, many of the challenges we've confronted, both pandemic related and financial, into opportunities for transforming the system to better deliver for Vermont and the students that we serve and doing that looking ahead in, for decades to come. Uh, we're also working hard to hold ourselves accountable and we've been working with the board of trustees to ensure that there are strategic priorities and goals in place to move us forward so we can continue meeting the needs of our students and the state. Uh, additionally, the select committee in their upcoming final report is planning on including uh, metrics uh, for us in their final report and the budget that's coming out of the house um, is also looking at ways to make sure that we're held accountable to the state and that we're in a position to provide regular updates on our performance, uh, meeting certain metrics and advising on what progress we're making, making towards those. So we do look forward to reporting back to you and partnering with you as we work together to tr transform the Vermont State College system into the future. As we've been thinking about change, we've focused on three key questions with regard to the changes that, that are under consideration. The first is, does the change meet the needs of students? The second is, does it meet the needs of the state? And the third is, does it contribute to the Vermont State College system's financial sustainability? And as we've gone through this work, we've developed a number of key pillars. The first pillar is student success as our key focus. And that means that we're committed to delivering on the higher education and continuing education needs of Vermont and Vermonters while preserving the high touch personalized approach and close knit campus communities that the Vermont State College system is known for. And in doing that, we're seeking to better serve students where they are with a learning modality that works for them on a schedule that works for them with the courses, programs, credentials, both credit bearing and non-credit bearing that provide them with the skills they need to attain their life goals and doing it at a price that they can afford. The next pillar is education for life. And we're trying to create opportunities for Vermonters at every point in their adult life. So from the early college dual enrollment programs that we have for high school students to credentials of value for working adults and those seeking to upskill and reskill. We do recognize that moving forward, we need to develop even more high quality educational opportunities that meet the needs of students, employers, and the state by expanding the availability of credentials of value, such as associate's degrees and credentials and certificates that will enable our students to secure higher paying employment or advance at work. Um, additionally, we need to continue our work on creating stackable credentials within our degree programs, 
because that provides maximum value and flexibility to our students. The next pillar is that Vermont is our community. So in addition to serving our students and meeting the workforce needs of Vermont, we are looking to maintain our physical presence in each of our current host communities. We're looking at combining a reduced physical footprint with expanded access to academic programs statewide and rural public institutions such as ours, we do provide crucial educational and employment opportunities to local residents. We serve as economic, social, and cultural anchors in our host communities. And we do help to educate workers in high demand local industries, such as healthcare, education, business, mental health counseling, uh, hospitality, and tourism. And the final pillar is consolidation of administrative functions. We do recognize that to achieve fiscal sustainability, we need to reduce administrative costs. And one of the ways we're looking at doing that is, is part of the transformation is, is this common accreditation that, that's been widely reported on. Um, and the goal of the common accreditation along with other system-wide administrative consolidation is to enable the Vermont State College system to avoid duplication, increase efficiency, improve compliance and reduce costs. So the select committee um, created, um, has issued two reports. The second one came out February 12th. And on February 22nd of 2021, the Vermont State College System um, Board of Trustees adopted the key recommendations that were in that select committee report. And that included an overall organizational structure for two complementary institutions with significant system-wide administrative consolidation. And this means that we're looking to unify Northern Vermont University, Vermont Technical College and Castleton University under a single accreditation and single leadership structure while maintaining the Community College of Vermont as a separate institution. And again, also looking at further administrative consolidations. The goal is to have the single accredited institution um, by the fall of 2023. We're doing this to better serve our students and meet our mission, but we also want to be clear that we are committed to maintaining our current physical locations across the state. The goal is to unify in a way that our students and our host communities feel minimal impact while also transforming us into the higher education institution the state of Vermont is asking us to be. So work on the appropriate academic program array for a combined Castleton University, Northern Vermont University, and Vermont Technical College is already underway. And that's grown out of the work that was undertaken by both Castleton and NVU in the fall to address duplicate programs. So that came out of some, um, we had a VSCS forward task force last summer. And one of the recommendations of that group was that, um, was that we look at eliminating duplicate programs. So we're also working on creating a single general education core which is also part of one of the recommendations that came out of the work last summer. Um, another thing we're doing is working on um, looking to expand the successful Hartness Library model that CCV and Vermont Tech currently have. And we're looking to create a system-wide virtual library. So we do recognize moving forward that we need to focus on the needs of Vermont and Vermont students for increased sub-baccalaureate degrees and non-degree programs, uh, certificates and credentials, and to that end, we're looking to create a director of workforce development uh, to serve as a single point of contact system-wide for workforce development and continuing education programming. And accordingly, we're, we're going to be developing a business plan and redesign business processes uh, in this coming academic year with the hope of launching that by July of 2022. Um, turning to the administrative consolidations, it is well recognized that the Vermont State College system needs to function as a consolidated system rather than as a confederation of institutions. Um, and we need to do that in order to realize the benefits of scale and to overcome the habits of history. Um, consolidating and modernizing administrative services adds value uh, through cost reductions, um, improved service for students and employees and workable solutions to common problems. And the consolidation and modernization of administrative services also includes developing and enforcing a standardized set of policies and procedures for services system-wide with delivery of services both in person and virtually. And to be clear, although functions may be centralized, 
This does not mean physical centralization in the chancellor's office. Instead, functions may well be centralized on individual campuses where there's particular expertise or where such expertise in a particular area can be created. So several of the areas that will be consolidated or have improved consolidation include procurement, financial aid, registration, admissions, marketing, information technology, and human resources. To be successful, transformation will require strong vision and leadership, disciplined project management, establishment of relevant success metrics, exceptional change management, and collaboration among all our stakeholders. And the slide that you now have in front of you is an illustration of what we're, we're talking about here in terms of having two separate institutions and then significant overlap, as you can see in the middle, as we look towards system-wide um, administrative consolidations. So as far as project planning goes, um, although the breadth of the transformation that we're proposing is revolutionary, we, we, can, we can build on the experience that we've already had through unifying Johnson and Linden. Uh, the leadership faculty and staff of NVU have demonstrated, for example, that a new brand and vision for education in rural communities can be developed while at the same time honoring the proud traditions and identities of individual institutions and programs. In addition, our faculty and staff have risen successfully to meet the challenges that were created by the pandemic. They've been delivering education in new ways, grounded in robust learning outcomes, collaborating and designing a single education curriculum, and doing all of that with a demonstrated commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So transformation is an enormous undertaking that will require substantial time and money. Um, if supported by ad additional funding from the legislature, the transformation will position the Vermont State College system to evolve and adjust to the disruptive forces confronting higher education nationally so that we can become financially sustainable, we can provide greater access to education to an increasingly diverse range of students at an affordable price, we can continue to be economic engines in the rural parts of the state, and we can serve as social, economic, and cultural anchors in our host communities as well as playing a critical role in meeting Vermont's future workforce needs. So preliminary work to map out the work ahead of us is shown on this slide. I know it's a in pretty intense slide, um, but it, it maps out the different areas and sort of timelines for those. It includes academic, administrative, facility, facilities, technology, and financial planning um, to ensure, ensure that our transformation is successful. And I do wanna be clear that although this is a pretty detailed look, um, we will continue um, to be uh, evolving these plans as we move forward. They're not set in stone. I mean, we understand that as soon as you undertake a project, you're going to be adjusting things, but it was important to sit down and figure out how we, would, uh, how we could do this and then the order of sequencing for different projects. But it's, as you can see from the slide, it is going to be an enormous amount of work. Um, the Board of Trustees is responsible for acting in the best interests of the system and it has a fiduciary responsibility to protect the public assets of the Vermont State College system, including its finances, as well as its reputation and role in the community. As such, it is responsible for approving major decisions, uh, for reviewing transformation progress and checking that benchmarks are being met. So this particular slide shows the board's key decision points moving forward um, over the next five years um, in connection with transformation. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sharon Scott to discuss uh, the funding. Thank you. Chancellor, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt. Um, do you have, did you email us that? I'm just trying to find that um, on our website. I don't believe we emailed that. We certainly can provide it to you. Um, I wouldn't mind. That more than good. happy to do that. Yes. Thanks so much. Okay. So with respect to funding, the select committee has proposed and the Ver Vermont State Colleges is working to obtain the funding necessary from the state to address our structural deficit and COVID related expenses, the cost of transformation and a permanent increase in base funding to enable the Vermont State Colleges to operate in a financially responsible and sustainable way into the future. For fiscal year 2022, the Vermont State Colleges is seeking $66 million. This includes the historic base appropriation of $30.5 million, an increase in base funding of $17.5 million, 
funding to address the structural deficit of 25 million and an additional $8 million in transformation expenses. As you can see from this slide, the Vermont State College's actual need is $81 million, but through the generous investments of, to the Vermont State Colleges by the legislature via the BAA, the federal HERF dollars coming into Vermont, and the internal austerity measures we are already undertaking, we've been able to reduce our request to $66 million. As an aside, in addition to the Vermont State College's budget request, when the budget comes over from the House, you may also see an additional one-time $20.5 million critical occupations scholarship package to support our students over the next few years. This package proposal includes internship incentives, scholarships, and workforce training proposals. We'd be happy to share additional details with you on this proposal today or at another time, understanding that our goal today is to focus on the transformation update. So in closing, we know we've got a significant amount of work ahead of us and we're not taking uh, the responsibility that we have to our students, the state, our employees, our host communities, our stakeholder groups lightly. We're carefully um, planning our transformation now and we look forward to your feedback and partnership on this in the months and years to come. Uh, we do recognize that in order to be successful, transformation is going to hinge on a number of things and that includes ongoing support from the state, the approval of our accrediting agencies and the US Department of Education that the pandemic is brought under control and we can get back to some, some form of normalcy and that we are able to achieve the $5 million in cost savings um, and or additional increases into revenue each year. So again, we do want to thank you for inviting us in today to share an update with you of what we're doing with transformation. Um, and we look forward to working with you moving forward. So thank you very much. And we look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, questions, <clears throat> or even uh, if senators, <clears throat> uh, in reviewing the other testimony, the response to questions uh, that was submitted, if anybody wants to highlight anything at this point or raise questions or concerns. Senator Persler. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had a question, and maybe this isn't the written stuff, I haven't had a chance to look at it, is you had mentioned the performance measures, that, and you had mentioned something about either the House listed some, or I just wondered what, what performance measures either have been identified or you're thinking we would use to identify successful transition? Yeah, so our board, when we went through our strategic priorities exercise with our board in the fall, uh, we came up with, they were very broad and obviously you can't achieve all those things right away. So we had identified a strategic focus on certain aspects of the, of the priorities. And then we had come up with metrics uh, that the colleges agreed to um, in connection to those. And again, they were around affordability, accessibility, uh, quality of programs and relevance of programs. So in addition to that, the, um, the select committee has also been looking at for their final report, what kinds of things can they put in there to, to sort of help keep us accountable as we move forward to make sure that we're hitting and particularly you know, hitting milestones in, uh, towards the transformation. And then I haven't seen the final version, but I do know that the House Appropriations Committee um, had drafted some language around um, what they're calling, I think, requirements, but things to put into with the budget bill to make sure that we're held accountable. And so, um, you know, some of the things, for example, like the five million dollars that we, you know, we achieve five million dollars in savings or increased revenue each year. Um, and then most recently, I think in response to other um, questions from other uh, committee members in a house appropriation, some additional very concrete ones were added in terms of, I'm trying to remember demographics enrollment, um, sizes of courses being taught. Um, there were some very, very specific ones in there as well. And again, I haven't seen the final version, but it, it had a pretty detailed uh, set of requirements for us. And I think part of the goal was also to make sure that we came back to report next legislative session to the education committees, the appropriations committees, commerce, you know, but we come back and report on all the things that we're doing. And okay. that's, you know, right. Okay, so they have those requirements. <clears throat> and then the select committee maybe is taking your five or four pillars and then putting some specific metrics on how that would be measured ongoing, like something like student success, you know, 
unless you have the metric, it's hard to tell. Or, right. right. So it's, I mean, I think that's really important. And one of the pieces that we recognize is in order to pull this off, we really need to have project, really high quality project management. And you, you've got to be able to measure to demonstrate that something's working. If it's not working, if strategy is not working, then you need to figure that out. And is there another strategy that might work better? So we recognize that we need both baseline data and we need to be in a position to measure ourselves to see where we're making progress or you know, is there some other obstacle that we hadn't appreciated before that we now need to address as we move forward? So we really are looking for a, a much more data-driven approach as we move forward on this. So will that be done by the board or like the select committee will do a recommendation when you might vote to, to implement those metrics or to use those metrics to, to do that measurement of success? Yeah, I would envision it to come from our board. So again, they've already agreed and accepted uh, a set of metrics um, as we work on our current strategic priorities. We will have, I'm, I'm assuming again, I know the, the still relatively early, I guess, in the budget process, but um, I assume at the final end, there will be in whatever the final budget is, there will be things there that will, will be required to, to follow through on. And I'm, I'm quite sure this, the board has been very responsive to the work of the select committee to date. So I fully expect that they will um, continue to look at what the select committee recommends. In fact, um, at our most recent uh, education personnel and student life committee meeting with our board of trustees, we presented our first round of uh, student dashboards, um, which really gave um, some really critical baseline information to our board of trustees that can be used as an initial baseline to be able to measure ourselves against. The first step is always trying to figure out where exactly are you so that you understand where it is that you need to go. Um, part of those benchmarks, for example, were measuring us against peer institutions, meaning rural small institutions that are comparable to ourselves. The good news in many ways, our performance is slightly better in many ways. Um, however, it's still a difficult situation that we're in right now because we need to be able to be more than we are today. Being slightly better than our peers isn't gonna get, cut it. We need to be a lot better than our peers. And so I think part of it is trying to figure out exactly where we are and in conjunction with the select committee, with the work that we expect will come, we, we welcome requirements coming out of the legislature. It is important to us that we give as much back to you so that you understand how we're progressing as you get from us. So, thank you. Senator Hooker, I'm gonna uh, give the floor to you. If you don't mind to manage questions, I have to step out and return a quick phone call. Okay, thank you, Senator Campion. And I, I'll ask a question as long as I have the floor. Um, thank you for being here and thank you for submitting answers to the questions that we had prior to this meeting to give us a chance to look at them. So I do have a few questions. First of all, one of the problems that we're hearing about with the merging is the branding of this of each institution. And um, I'm curious to know, um, you, we've already seen the uh, coming together of Johnson and Linden into Northern Vermont University. And I'm wondering, you know, what was the, the cost of that um, merger and did it accomplish the goals that were intended? Yeah, I mean, and I, I would say yes, we certainly were able to realize a significant amount of cost savings from that. Um, and again, I think our experience with Northern Vermont University illustrates that we do know what the challenges are when we, when we do this and we bring colleges together and we do know how strongly people feel about their individual campuses and their, their history and their traditions. Um, Sharon was at um, Northern Vermont University, which was at Johnson State College for many years and then at Northern uh, Vermont University and was there in an integral part of the unification piece. So I will let her respond too because she can give you some more color I think than I can. Absolutely. So um, I, I can speak really clearly to the visceral, visceral response that happens when someone says you're going to merge with a sister institution who has always been your competitor. It is um, the, uh, all of what we are hearing from 
our constituents today are the same things that I heard then and that I felt. I had been a longtime employee of one institution and was suddenly going to be working with two of our institutions as a combined entity. And um, so it, we had the ability to be able to meet the vast majority of the objectives that were placed before us. You asked about the cost. The legislature set aside $2 million um, through a special appropriation as part of the Budget Adjustment Act um, for us to be able to fund um, the merger activities related to creating Northern Vermont University. Um, and those funds were spent in a wide variety of ways, everything from signage and um, changing the name on the sides of buildings and on the sides of vehicles, um, roadside signs, um, but also to um, address the actual brand as it's created, um, the underlying website, um, the marketing materials, um, and some initial advertising that went along with it. So it was a soup to nuts activity. It was not nearly as complex as what we're talking about here in terms of the transformation of the Vermont State Colleges. Um, in that situation, we were just merging two institutions, not bringing together three disparate institutions addressing um, administrative consolidations um, and also simultaneously trying to make sure that we uh, remove $25 million from our budget or increase the revenues on an ongoing basis. Um, but it was um, an opportunity for us to make sure that we throughout the process continued to honor both institutions, maintaining local mascots and traditions. So there are traditions on both campuses um, that continue to this very day. The ringing of the bell, which is the down at the opening of a school every year on our Johnson campus continues to happen. Um, there is a, um, a dip in very cold water um, in the pond at Linden that continues to happen. Um, and so there are many traditions that continue to remain that we would anticipate will continue no matter what we do. Those traditions are part of the fabric of the what makes a community a community. Um, and so as we move forward, we will want to make sure that we understand what those are. And by working with the people who are current students, alumni, faculty, staff, and community members to make sure that we honor um, where we can. Uh, so uh, it, was, uh, it was a big process, but I think we were able to achieve our goals. And I think that it will continue to be a big process, and I appreciate the idea of the traditions remaining. I guess the question is the naming, and that that is you know one of the serious concerns, certainly, that we have in this section of the state. Um, and if I can go on to just one more question before I pass it over to my colleagues, uh, with regard to um, the finances of each institution, uh, are we going to know what each institution, you know, the finances of each institution, where the successes are, maybe where the failures are, um, will we be able to parse that out amongst the um, pieces of the state college system? Yeah, so uh, once I, the merger is complete, I yeah. I was, so I was going to say once, yeah. Right now, we've we're moving towards a system wide budget. So last year, the board decided to, we should move to a system wide budget. Previous, we are one. Just to be clear, we're one financial entity. We're one corporate entity. So all our finances are reported on a system wide basis. Um, right now, we do have the ability to. Um, you know, each individual college and the presidents manage their budgets to a certain extent. Um, but again, system-wide budgeting is really going to re rethink the way we do things. So when we, when we move forward, once we have a common accreditation, we won't be looking at separate statements for, um, you know, the, the Randolph Vermont Tech um, campus or the Castleton campus or the Johnson campus. It will all be part of one institution. And that was really one of the reasons why the select committee recommended that we move in this direction. So for example, they pointed out that there's a lot of data in the report, but one of the things that's in the report, for example, is that Vermont Technical College, um, the cost to deliver its programs is higher than it is for um, comparator institutions across the country. Um, NVU does pretty well. So NVU I think is like 8% more, um, but Vermont Tech is, is above. Uh, Castleton is also very expensive. Um, and so 
one of the things the select committee was thinking about with this is so for example, Vermont Tech, Vermont Tech provides critical programs to the state. They're very expensive programs, right? They're much more expensive to, to man a paramedicine program or whatever versus a history class. So one of the things that's happened over the, the way we're currently structured is we're asking Vermont Tech to really carry those very, very expensive programs alone. And so one of the reasons for combining together is to help to address some of the financial challenges in a way where we're doing it across the whole system. So, you know, I think this is moving forward. It's not going to be a question of, well, how is Randolph doing or how is Castleton doing? It's it, we're going to be looking as a whole. And again, I think back to the comments I was saying earlier is rural public institutions will require a lot of assistance. You cannot do that uh, depending just on tuition from students, um, particularly the students we serve. We're, we're open access. We're serving a lot of first generation Pell eligible students. So the students we have do not come from backgrounds where they can pay high tuition. So it really requires an investment from the state in order for us to be able to fund um, you know, and provide high quality programming across the state in all these different areas. So it's, you know, I, I know kind of where that sentiment is coming from. There's a sense of, you know, one campus is doing much better than other campuses. Um, you know, one, I think some of that data is not necessarily accurate, but two, that's not really the way to look at this moving forward. The goal is going to be, are we providing, is this new entity providing high quality programs across the state that are accessible to students across the state rather than taking a, a campus by campus look. And again, we've been very clear and the, I think the select committee has been clear. I know our board has been clear. We may be really looking at, at um, the campuses may look quite different. Um, not all the campuses may necessarily look exactly the way they do today. So we, we're going to have to think, we, again, we've got to achieve a significant amount of cost savings here as we move forward. So we are going to have to really innovate and think differently about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So it doesn't mean that every campus is going to do everything. Every campus is going to look exactly the way it is now, but we do believe it's really important to maintain that physical location to provide access to place bound students in the communities where they are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, looking forward, I don't, again, Sharon's the financial person here, but I don't believe we'll be in a position to say, oh, look, you know, this campus is not doing as well as this campus because it won't be divided that way financially. So while we may not be able to do that because um, that isn't, as a single institution, that, that won't be um, something that's available to us. What we may be able to do is to provide information regarding the amount it costs or the profitability of specific programs. Mm -hmm. Because part of what we're doing is educating in programs that can be very costly to do so, but they're extremely necessary to the state of Vermont. It's also part of the affordability equation. So if we want to make sure, for example, that we are educating people um, in certain engineering or paramedicine type of programs, then we may have to be able to come to you and say, this is what it's costing to run this program, the number of students that we can have. Um, even saying nursing, for example, you can only have so many nursing students in a class, unlike a history class, or you could maybe have 30 students in the course. A nursing class doesn't allow you to do so. But we can perhaps provide you with some of that level of specificity. And as we start to look at the strategic financial planning of the Vermont State Colleges, those are the decisions that we really need to be able to look at and say, what does it cost to run certain things of certain programs? What kind of revenue are they generating? And is that program something that we need to continue to offer because it's of vital importance to the state? And because it's of such vital importance, we need to offer greater funding to that. That could be a location, it could be a program, but most likely it's a program. Okay. Thank you. And Senator Campion, I'll let you take over. I kind of monopolized that yep. time that you were gone. But I believe it's Senator Terenzini uh, and then Senator uh, Lyons. Thank you, Senator uh, Campion. And um, Sophie and Sharon, nice to see you. Uh, I'll echo some of Senator Hooker's comments. You, you're you blessed with two thirds of the Rutland County Senate delegation here in education. So um, <laughs> it might not be a blessing after I'm done, but uh, <laughs> Look at I 
there's a lot that I could say. Um, and I, and I really, I'll just get to the point. I won't sugarcoat it, but there's a lot in the County delegation that are really concerned that Castleton is going to get the short end of the, of the deal here. And there's muni local municipalities are concerned. Businesses are concerned about the Castleton brand. And I apologize about the hammering. We have some work getting done here, but, um, the the brand of Castleton that that has been built over the last decade with Spartan Arena and the new football stadium and the new dormitories and the programs added changing it in 2015 to Castleton from Castleton State College to Castleton University that was a brand transformation that has made uh, Castleton as a educational institution and this region it's really put it on the map in our opinion and to first of all to to change the name to whatever it's gonna be, Vermont State Colleges at Castleton really could hurt the image of this university. Uh, we think that more students attend or uh, are attracted to Castleton with that university uh, name at the end of it. Uh, and so, you know, we would really, or I and others in the delegation that I've spoke to would really like to see the name Castleton University be at the front and then say Castleton University of Vermont State Institution or have a tagline at the end. But keeping that unique and, I, and, and um, special identification is critical because we don't want to lose momentum and we don't want to hurt not only the college, but the, uh, the uh, uh, economy in the Rutland region. Uh, my second point is, you know, going to a single corporation entity or, or combining all the financials, uh, um, I say with all due respect, could lead to the lack of transparency. It's really important for taxpayers and the legislature um, and students to know, is, is this institution a pull or a drag on the financial uh, integrity of the entire program? In other words, is Castleton um, funding uh, NVU or vice versa? Uh, is um, Vermont Tech uh, causing the system to go uh, belly up? These are questions that I think people have. And by combining the finances and not making it more transparent, but some would say making it less transparent, this it's not a good place to be. I think we all admit that we have a problem here, but each individual institution should have its own P&L statements and we should be able to look at the, at the soup and nuts of it and say, hey, listen, this school is profitable or it's not. And some would argue that um, colleges shouldn't run like businesses, but I would say if we had ran the, the state college system more like a business over the last so many years, we wouldn't be in the position we are today. I think we have to have more of a business mind and look at those P&Ls and really determine is this school a winner or loser at the end of the day financially to the taxpayers of, of Vermont. So. All right. Um, do, do you want me to respond on that? Please. I, just, I wasn't sure if it was just a, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, as far as transparency goes, I mean, all our finances are incredibly transparent. We went through the state treasurer, um, did a full analysis of us last summer um, all our materials are publicly available on our website. There's no lack of transparency about the state of our colleges. Um, my, my mission as Chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges is to see it survive, and that includes Castleton. Um, this is a way for, for Castleton to survive, to be honest. If we don't include Castleton in this, um, it is difficult for me to see how the Vermont State College system can survive unless the legislature is willing to support us at a much higher rate um, moving forward. Um, you know, one of the benefits, uh, the, the, being in a system has pluses and minuses. So one of the pluses has been that over time, over the past two decades, the, 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 um, there have been highs and lows for different colleges. So at times, um, different institutions could have gone under and were not, didn't go under because they were able to benefit from being part of a system and receiving a system-wide loan. The downside is that if you have, uh, and this is, was the challenge with the proposal that was made last, uh, last spring by the former chancellor, is if you, if you close an institution, um, the cost of that institution then are borne by the remaining institutions. So for example, if you shut down um, one entity the retiree health costs, the carrying costs, the debt that, that belongs to that institution then gets pushed back out onto the remaining institutions. And I think what, what the, rea the real situation that we were in was if that occurs, that was going to bring down all the remaining other institutions within the system. So I think at this point, it's a question of 
It's not winners and losers within the system. I know there's a perception out there that Castleton is somehow better than, stronger than other institutions in the system. Unfortunately, that is not accurate. Um, Castleton has no strategic reserves, has, the, has a, a, a debt, a loan that it owes to the system. Um, it has the greatest amount of debt. Um, so it has tremendous strengths. We certainly want to see Castleton survive. We certainly want to continue the experience and the, the passion that people feel for Castleton. We want them to have that opportunity. We want students to continue to come to Castleton. So we're not looking here at picking winners and losers around the system. Uh, the reality is, is that the colleges uh, fill different niches um, and there are other institutions within the system that are serving Vermont. Uh, they're serving students where they need to be served. They have programs that are important to the state of Vermont. Um, I, I get the name, I totally understand that. Uh, the challenge is, is that as far as the, uh, our accreditors go, the um, New England Commission on Higher Education, the Department of Education, we have one name. It, it, once you're accredited as a single accreditation, you have one name. So there is nothing to prevent us from preserving the best of Castleton or from continuing to market um, Castleton as a place to come to and the experiences you can have at Castleton, the football team at Castleton, et cetera. But the, the, the overall name will have to be reflective of, of whatever the new combined entity is. So theoretically, it could be Castleton University and then you know Vermont Tech is part of Castleton University and Northern Vermont University is part of Castleton University. I suspect that the folks at those communities would feel pretty strongly about that. Um, but again, we haven't made any decisions on names. There will be a opportunity for input uh, the board will ultimately make the decision on the name, um, but I believe there are ways we can address the concerns that the Castleton community and the Rutland community have. Um, these aren't unique concerns. I mean, people obviously feel very passionate about their institution, where they work, where they went to school, uh, you know, the, the memories and things that they have. So really this proposal is a way to make sure that we can continue to serve students around the state we can preserve the education that we have and that we really are serving the state because a lot of the, the programs that we provide are programs that otherwise aren't provided um, across the state and they're vitally important to the workforce of the state. So I do, you know, I, I've obviously I've been inundated with, with feedback from people in the Rutland area. I know this is a very emotional issue, um, but I, I really strongly believe that we've, we've got to survive and the way we survive is by working together um, moving forward, that trying to pull apart is not going to be ultimately successful for us, uh, for the Vermont State College system or for the state. Do you have a follow-up, Senator Terenzini? Yeah, thank you, Senator Kennedy, and thanks, Sophie, for your response. I, I would say that, you know, my, our concern, many of our concern around the county with the name is not of uh, days gone by or, or of feelings of nostalgia. It is that there has been a powerful brand built around the Castleton University name. And by changing it, it's gonna be extremely detrimental in our opinion um, to not only the attractiveness of the school uh, in the short term, but of our economic engine here in Rutland County. So that's it. Um, one last question and then I'll let others ask. Um, have, have you heard from a number of alumni who pledge to the, the school or give financially and, and who have said that they no longer would contribute to a uh, to the university if it was called anything but Castleton? I have not, but I do believe that Castleton has received some of those calls. And again, that's not particularly unusual um, for that to happen when you go through these, these kinds of mergers. However, I can say that with the merger of Northern Vermont University with Lyndon and Johnson, while there was a tremendous um, outcry of those who said that they would not donate, actual donations went up um, in the year following the announcement, and they have continued to climb, um, with the university receiving the single largest gift of the Vermont State Colleges in this last six months. Um, so while that, that is a possibility, um, often what we, you find with a merger situation is that because there is greater attention placed on stewarding your donors and um, having reasons to be in contact with them that you can actually increase your donations. Senator Lyons. Uh, 
so uh, a number of my questions have been um, asked, but I'm going to ask them maybe a different way. So <clears throat> one of the things, it's all about the branding, of course. That's what everyone's talking about. What are we going to name this organization going forward? That's really so critical and important. And I, 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 I agree with everything that you all have said, every one of you. Um, but the, um, when, we, when we think of a CCV student, we can characterize why a CCV student attends CCV. And so that, that's become extremely clear about uh, folks' needs and their, um, their short-term and their long-term goals, their, their need to enter a higher education uh, slowly and working full-time, raising a family. So we, we understand that, sort of the non-traditional um, educational process. When I think of a Castleton State, uh, a Castleton University uh, student, I don't know. I, I have kind of a thought about who those students are, but have they, have you characterized why they come to Castleton? And then have you characterized what is drawing students to NVU, Lyndon and Johnson? So is there a picture of those students? Mm -hmm. And, and then, then to, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish asking this question, but I will have others. And then have you um, looked at the, at the folks who are in those communities and around who have gravitated toward CCV? I'm leaving VTC out of it for right now, but I'll come back to that. But have you characterized those students who might have gone to a, a, a larger, longer, more intense program had you been able to characterize what their needs are? Um, at the, in the NVU area. So I'm thinking more about the student and, and who the student is and what then attracts them into a specific uh, environment. Yeah, so we've, I mean, it, I think as Sharon had mentioned, um, our um, education personnel student life committee has really focused on um, seeking dashboard metrics in terms of who our students are and who we serve. And I, I think you're absolutely right. We need to know who we serve because we need to figure out how we can continue to serve them and make sure we're meeting the needs of all the students, including students that perhaps we don't even have yet that we can um, determine that we need to reach out to and do a better job of reaching out to in the future. Um, Castleton is certainly the more traditional 18 to 24 year old age group. Um, again, we have all this stuff broken out, uh, the profiles of students um, by institution. Um, so certainly I think as we, as we think ahead, one of the things we really need to focus on is how do we explain, um, how do we present, how do we market the whole variety of different experiences you can have at the Vermont State College system? I mean, I think we have to focus on that. Um, how do we serve the needs both of an out-of-state student who may want to go to a Castleton University, um, you know, the, the athletics and the, the, the community, the, 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 the you know, campus life that you have at um, a Castleton, versus someone that wants a really hands-on experiential learning um, at Vermont Technical College versus you know, the experiences that students um, treasure that they have at, at Johnson and Linden. And I think part of this is gonna be the work that we do moving forward. And, and certainly as you look at that, the timeline that we put out there, um, we're realizing that um, in order to do the transformation, we have to do it sequentially. So we've got to figure out what programs will we be offering and where will we be offering them? Then we have to figure out the marketing. How are we going to market these programs? How are we going to market the, the new entity that's created? And then think about the admissions. But I think we need to think much more expansively about who our students are. And they're not just the 18 to 24 year olds. They are also going to be um, you know, high school students that are looking for early college experiences. They're also going to be people that have some college credits and never finished up. They're going to be people that are, want to change careers or they want to go in a different direction or they need to um, upskill or reskill at work. So we're going to have a, a significant challenge ahead of us in terms of how do we reach out and market to all those different populations as we move forward. So in thinking about that um, 
so from the curricular point of view, then in order to make that attraction possible and to to uh, reach students that uh, that might be more non-traditional, have you considered um, you know like individualized learning programs that include some technology or internal networking between and among your individual campuses that would allow for folks who are working with kids. Uh, I mean, I just think, that I, I hope, I, I'm just, just want, you know, I really would hope that there is some creativity going on because otherwise uh, it will be just another college campus. And there's an opportunity here to um, have new uh, new structures. When you when you talk, we're talking about um, sort of amortizing the the physical plant costs and the costs across all the campuses. That's one thing that's great. As long as uh, you're not sacrificing the more costly programs, such as the sciences or or mm -hmm. nursing or some of those that are uh, so critical. And, and then I'll, I'll just, I, I won't comment further. I could go, I, this is a great conversation. This would be fun to, to carry on with you and I enjoy it. But, um, you know, when I think of Johnson, I think of an arts center. When I think of Linden, I think of meteorology, you know, so there are some things that we all can be very proud of in our state um, and VTC, of course, um, but but it is expensive and and maybe there's some uh, some rationale for um, fine tuning what's at each of the, what's at that campus as compared with others. So I, won't so, I mean to be to be clear, we really are thinking about really trying to reimagine how we do things, and we do have faculty that have really stepped up and and are very creative and thoughtful. Um, and so we already have faculty that are, that are co-teaching between Northern Vermont University and Castleton this semester with more coming next semester. So someone can be teaching in a classroom on the Castleton campus. We have an archeology span professor, that, uh, Matt Mariority, that's doing that right now. He's teaching in a classroom with students physically there. And then he has students appearing uh, via telepresence from the Johnson campus. So they've got a bigger class uh, they've got, you know, more diversity in the class. They've got different opinions. It's working very well. We have other, we have another professor. We have a math professor at um, NVU Johnson who has been teaching um, high level math courses. I don't know quite how he does it, but he teaches uh, in person um, synchronously, which means there are students participating remotely at the same time the class is being held and he's teaching asynchronously. So one class he's teaching three different ways Instead of he normally would have eight students in the class, he has over 20 students because he's able to attract students um, that, again, might be working parents. They might be uh, folks that want to be able to do it at the weekend in the evenings on their own time. But he's 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 also able to teach it in person to the students that are there on the campus and those that are um, remotely, maybe, you know, students down at Castleton or whatever. So we really have to be, um, you know, and that's going to be part of um you know, we're also requesting funding to really help us uh, on the technology end to make sure that all of this happens. But that would be the goal is that this is really about expanding opportunities for students and making programs more available um, across the system. So they're not isolated on, on individual campuses and they're trying to be creative with it. And again, I know, you know, many people will say, you know, online doesn't work or online students don't like online. Um, the experience that we've seen is that, um, Online done well can be incredibly effective. Um, so again, you need to make sure that you're providing the professional development um, and assistant on, on course design um, to faculty to make sure that they're, they're able to provide the best quality programs that they can provide. But we certainly see, for example, with CCV, whose students are probably the ones that you would think would, be, would need the most in-person assistance. And yet CCV has very successfully transferred to being 100% online this, this past year. Um, they already were at a place pre-pandemic where 50% of their courses were being taught online by choice, student choice. Students were signing up for the online courses and filling them in. And so again, we've, we've been able to see um, flex courses, flexible start dates, 
um, accelerated courses, doing courses on your own schedule. I mean, there's just so many interesting and exciting things that are happening. And again, it's all about trying to meet the students where they are, giving them the programs they're looking for at a cost that they can afford, but also in a delivery method that works for them. And for some of them, it will be in person on campus and having a traditional residential experience. For others, it may well be, you know, a working, working mom with little kids. It may well be that she's doing it at eight o'clock at night or at the weekends and being able to be flexible and provide the courses that people are looking for um, in a way that they can access. So I, I do think there's just tremendous potential here to really reimagine what we can do with the Vermont State College system. I see you, Senator. Uh, thank, thank you. I, I just have one last thing. Uh, just, just to say that the, that the term you use, flexibility, is absolutely key. And it's so key for the faculty uh, and, and administration. But um, uh, <laughs> being open to individual um, needs, and I include in that administrators and faculty and students alike. Otherwise, uh, you end up with some um, disruption, some concerns. Now, finally, this one last comment. All these things are so great that you're talking about, but CCV is a brand it, that everything you've said about CCV, we all know, and, and the students know it, and prospective students know it. So how can that new opportunity at NVU, whatever the name is, uh, characterize the new institution? Uh, I'll end there. You don't have to answer the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Senator Chen, do you want to uh, close for us? Really quick, because I know we have a full agenda, and I just want to recognize Senator Terenzini's concern. And uh, UVM, I bleed green and gold, and UVM's official name is the University of Vermont, not U of V. And it's actually, if you look at our charter, it's the University of Vermont and State Agricultural University, but you never hear that other part. Uh, so I just know that when we put the, some smart marketing people in the rooms, we're gonna, I'm sure you're going to be able to maintain that Castleton University feel in that campus. And I look over to New York where they have SUNY Plattsburgh, SUNY Albany. I'm not saying we want to be VSU, Castleton, and so on, but I'm sure that uh, given the energy around keep maintaining that, that history, uh, it can be accomplished. And I, I have heard the same from many constituents. They don't want to lose that Castleton root, those Castleton yeah. roots, and they encourage the, uh, the VSU to continue to pursue that. Thanks. Yeah, we've heard it down here, certainly as well. Any final uh, questions or comments before we take uh, just a five minute break and move on to the Governor's Institute? Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We always appreciate you. coming and talking yeah. to you. So we'll have you back, I'm sure, again soon. Uh, committee, let's just take five thank minutes. You.